Okay, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Jess Brooks. I work for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I am the Southern Region Wildlife Education Coordinator. Tonight we are talking about a whole bunch of neat information all about owls. So thank you so much for joining me. And um, so this is a Nevada Department of Wildlife Conservation Education Program. I am with education with NDAO, the Nevada Department of Wildlife. This is a friendly reminder that this is a family program and is rated PG. Profanity or inappropriate behavior won't be tolerated. I have the ability to remove you if that is the case. However, I've never had to do that. Hopefully I won't have to tonight. So let's keep it quick, simple and friendly this evening. There are two ways that you can all communicate with me this evening. Um, one way is through the chat box. So at the very bottom of your screen, you will see a chat a button that you can click on, a chat box will pop up and I won't be typing in the chat, but I will be able to see chat requests, chat statements, comments come through throughout the program. Uh, so I'll be watching that at the same time as presenting. The second way that everyone can participate is through the Q&A box or the question and answer box. So I do have a moderator tonight. His name is Riley. Hello, Riley. Thank you so much for helping me tonight. If anyone has questions to ask, you can type those in the Q&A box and Riley will be answering those live. I won't be viewing those until the very end, um, but Riley is on top of it. So if anyone has questions throughout, that's where you can go for that. So tonight is a somewhat of a special webinar before we jump into the education portion and the information portion. This program in particular is in partnership with other organizations to help you get outside and capture photos of all of our wonderful biodiversity this summer in our lovely state. Through iNaturalist, through the Nevada Department of Wildlife, through the Museum of Natural History, through Nevada Bugs and Butterflies and the Truckee Meadow Parks Foundation. All of these organizations have been working together to bring everybody in Nevada the Summer Nature Blitz. And it's through iNaturalist, very easy to join. I'm joined. I haven't been outside as much as I'd like to be because of the heat, but I have been out here and there. So the program through iNaturalist is a challenge. Uh, the challenge is to record as much biodiversity as possible in Nevada during the outdoor adventures throughout the summer that you might take. Experts from UNR and um, these partnering organizations will help with the identification of some of the tricky species. So the adventure will not only help us learn something about all of the wildlife, all of the plants that live in Nevada, but will also help you understand um, all of the plants and animals that call Nevada home. It's very easy to join. Simply go to inaturalist.org or you can download the app. That's how I do it um, and create an account. Search for the Summer Nature Blitz. Uh, 2021, it will pop up and you simply um, click join and anything that you record, any observation you make, any pictures that you take and upload will automatically be entered through the app, through the website um, into the Nevada Nature Blitz project. The project lasts until September 15th. We started back in May and we've been doing programs like this, webinars like this, to help some of the audience members and guests and visitors get connected with Nevada wildlife and Nevada plants, but also um, help with some of the identification techniques, where to look for these plants and animals. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on owls, some of my very favorite critters. Um, there are five things we're going to be focusing on tonight. First, 
Owl identification will encompass special characteristics, special features, identification basics for owls in particular, what to look for, and of course some species showcases. Now, some of these species showcases will focus on seven owls or seven owl species that we commonly find in Nevada and will show off their field markings, lots of pictures, nesting behavior, where you might find a nest or where you might find them roosting, hunting behavior, where you might find them hunting or cruising around while they're active and the best time to go birding for that owl. And uh, just a side note, I am noticing that my subtitles for the screen are covering a bit of the information. So no worries, you won't be missing anything, um, but if you are, I'll make a note to change that. So just a few special characteristics, that's the first thing. Uh, owls are wild, they can take care of themselves. We do not need to take care of them. We don't need to feed them. We don't need to capture them. We don't need to groom them or clean up after them. They're wild animals, they're very unpredictable. However, they are, they are very good at taking care of themselves. They are nocturnal for the most part. I have an asterisk near that because owls are typically nocturnal or crepuscular. Crepuscular means that they are alert at dawn and at dusk. There's one hour that will, one owl that we'll be chatting about during the program that is diurnal. Diurnal is awake during the day. And we'll talk about that owl in a little bit. Uh, birds of prey, owls are birds of prey. They are also called raptors. So raptors and birds of prey can sort of be used interchangeably. And we'll talk about more um, in a little bit what makes a bird a raptor. Um, they are carnivores. They eat only meat from other animals. They do not eat seeds or plants. And lastly, they are excellent at blending into their environments or they have um, excellent strategies for camouflaging themselves. For example, there is one owl that we'll be chatting about later that is called the sawwit owl the northern sawit owl. And uh, this, <laughs> this owl is not only extremely well camouflaged, but its body posture helps it stay camouflaged. Um, one of its defense mechanisms is to stay as still as possible. So that not only helps them blend in, but um, also helps them appear as if they're part of the environment. All right, so very quickly, let's go over some of our special features for owls. This is a barn owl. Um, all owls, mostly, um, especially the ones that we'll be talking about tonight, have a facial disc. Um, this facial disc helps funnel sound into their ears, sort of like a satellite dish. Um, it just helps sound go where it needs to go. They have specialty feathers and wings. This will include a plumage coloration or feather coloration, feather shape. Feathers can help keep them warm or provide structure and strength. They can help keep them camouflaged and it, um, certain feathers can help them fly silently to sneak up on their prey. Ears. Owls have ears, even though they're tucked away behind the protection of their feathers. Ears are asymmetrical or lopsided, meaning that one ear is typically higher than the other on their skull. Now this can help them in hunting techniques. And if for whatever reason it's, it's super pitch dark or they have damage to their eyes, their ability to hear exactly where something is can help them stay alive. Their eyes, their eyes are very special. They are spherical and locked in their eye sockets. This means that they can't look around using their eyes like humans can. They have to look around using their heads and neck only. Uh, this allows for their eyes to have zero blood vessels, which eliminates blind spots. Humans have blind spots, so that's one advantage owls have over us. Their eyes are also forward facing, very similar to ours. This gives them excellent binocular vision and helps them see 
very, very well. Um, what next? Oh, they have a sharp hooked beak. Now, um, having a sharp hooked beak or bill is one of the reasons why owls are considered birds of prey or raptors. This uh, sharp hooked beak helps them tear apart and rip apart flesh before eating it. And the last one, I know it's tucked away behind there, behind my uh, subtitles, but it is sharp talons. So having sharp talons is yet another um, reason why owls are considered raptors. And those sharp talons not only help them grip onto things while they're perching, but also clasp onto prey and help carry prey from one area to another. So as far as owl identification basics go, there are five. The first one is all owls belong to one of two families. The first one is Tytonidae. I'm not sure if that will pop up in my um, um, captions at the bottom there, but it is pronounced Tytonidae. I don't think it's popping up correctly, but that's okay. Um, those are barn owls and bay owls. We have one species of owl in this family. The other is Strigidae, which are all the other owls. And we'll talk about which owl be belongs in each family when we get to individual species. Too tuft or not too tuft. So upright feathers that sort of look like horns on the top of their heads. Those are feather tufts. Some owls have them, some don't. And field markings in particular are plumage colorations and patterns. And this can really help you quickly identify some of the common owls. Hunting techniques. Um, this is super useful if you are going out and birding, especially if you're going to participate in the summer um, online project through iNaturalist. Field markings can do a lot, but if you get to know a little bit about their behavior, this can absolutely help you figure out which owl is which. And lastly, vocalization. So I will also be sharing some vocalizations for each owl. So you may need to turn up your volume on your computer when we get to that point. There are four key features to look for when identifying specific species. We kind of talked about these a little already, but when we get to each species showcase, I will share all four of these um, key features. One is size and shape. Second is plumage patterns. Third is behavior. Those two things, plumage patterns and behavior are key. And lastly, vocalization. It's very rare that I actually hear vocalizations when I'm out birding, um, in particular for owls. Songbirds, I hear them all the time. But for owls, I don't really hear their, their, their vocals or their calls unless they don't think I'm there. So it just kind of depends, but I'll, I'll still be sharing them with you. All right, so that was very quick. Um, I shared a lot of information with you. So as far as species identification goes, we're going to jump right in. Uh, this is where you, the audience, get to participate a little with me. Some of these are very easy. Some are a little difficult. Some you might know, some may be new. So as I go through each species, I will share information about each one. And your challenge as the audience is to go to the chat and let me know what species it is before I tell you. With each species, I'll be sharing those four key features to look for and then the calls at the very end. Oh, and we'll, we, we will be going over seven common Nevada owls. So first we have this owl. So if you do know what owl this is, Go to the chat, type it in. I do have the chat open so I can see your responses. If you don't know, totally fine. That's why we're here after all, we're here to learn. So these owls are from the family Strigidae. They are a tufted owl. You see those tufts, those horn-like feathers on top of their head. That is not where their ears belong. Their ears are where our ears are. 
um, on the sides of their head, but remember their ears are, or all owl ears are just a little bit lopsided. They're asymmetrical. So typically their right ear will be higher than their left ear. Those tufts, the purpose of those feather tufts are to help the owl blend into their environment. So these owls are about the size of a crow or goose. They're thick bodied, mottled gray brown with some vermiculation patterns on their chests. That's the lines that you see on their chest. That pattern is called vermiculation. And you'll also see some reddish brown, light tan, um, light brown, some white patches within those feathers. They have um, that um, facial disc that we discussed earlier, but that disc is outlined in black or dark brown and the inner color is typically brown or cinnamony. And they have a black beak and bright yellow eyes. So this is a great horned owl. I did see that a lot of you got it right in the chat. Excellent job. So a little bit more about the great horned owl. They are nocturnal. Um, typically you'll see them just after it gets dark and right before it starts getting light again. Most great horned owls will take like a little break in the pitch dark of the night, in the middle of the night, just to rest, recoup before they go out and hunt again. They have a really wonderful, beautiful plumage coloration. And as you can see from these two, pic two pictures, the one on the left, this one right here, is the outside of the owl's wings. You see that vermiculation happening on the chest. And then the back side of the wings, you have that mottled gray, patchy, white and tan or brown coloration that blends in really well with the barks of trees. But then on the inside of their wings, you have almost a dark brown or light brown checkerboard pattern that breaks up that coloration and helps them blend in with their surroundings. As far as nesting goes, they can basically nest anywhere from trees to cacti to cliffs and cliff faces. They're also known to be seen near woodlands, swamps, orchards, agricultural areas, forest fields, deserts, um, wetlands, even residential and suburban areas. For example, um, in one of the homes that I lived in previously, we had owls living somewhat close by. We could hear their calls. It was actually pretty cool. Um, they have an extremely diverse diet, eating basically anything that they can pick up and carry away. This is This can include rodents, insects, like big insects, birds, um, gophers, marmots, even cats, like feral cats. So take care of your pets if you have them. Even small dogs, so just watch out for your pets. Ravens, rabbits, even fish, squirrels, and ducks. So basically anything that they can grab and nab up and carry away. Um, baby owls are called owlets and they also blend in extremely well to their environment. Most often they have those down feathers poking out, those extra fluffy down feathers, and they have that dusky buff coloration. All right, let me see if I can turn my laser pointer off so I can open the calls. So um, I am gonna play a couple calls for you this evening. Um, just a reminder, if you can't hear them, no worries. I'll provide the link at the very end to where I got all of these calls, all of these vocalizations. Um, but if, uh, if you can't hear them, turn up your computer volume a little bit and I'm gonna play just a few for you. So that is a typical great horned owl song. It's the hoo 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 noise that we are so familiar with. All right, next up on our list of owl species, 
I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but if you do know, go ahead and type that into the chat. These owls are small. They are less than a foot tall. They're pretty little critters. They are about the size of a robin, a little taller, maybe a crow. They're round headed. Uh, they are from the family Strigidae, but they do not have tufts. They are round headed. They are typically sandy colored owls that live in the ground. That's a big clue. They have long yellow legs, bright charismatic white eyebrows. So they are very charismatic and usually they look pretty grumpy. And they have light colored narrow patches below their sharp feet. And that's right above their neckline here and right below their neckline kind of guides into the rest of their body plumage. I do see some guesses happening in the chat. Some of you are correct, some of you are incorrect. This is the Western Bing Owl. Uh, just a couple more tidbits of information for the burrowing owl. They are diurnal, they're awake during the daytime, just like people. Um, their field markings show mottled brown and sandy pale spots on the underparts. That's their chest, their neck, and the insides of their wings. Their breast is spotted grading to dark brown bars on the belly and the bars will run this way longitudinally. They have a bright white throat and those white eyebrows, bright yellow eyes, um, which is what they're typically known for. As far as nesting goes, burrowing owls live in the ground in burrows that they've dug themselves or in burrows that they've taken over that were dug by squirrels, tortoises, skunks, badgers, or other rodents. Their burrows can be found in open grasslands, deserts, open plains, um, wide open areas of low to the ground vegetation, even ditches and hilly culvert areas. I've even seen burrowing owls near um, near areas where humans are doing construction because the ground is so easy to work with. They will kind of just take over a little zone there. But for birders, fledglings and owlets, baby owls, can be seen hanging out near the burrow entrances and will noticeably have some adult plumage, but will look a little rough. Um, they'll have those fluff feathers, those fluffy gray feathers poking out. Um, with some of that mottled gray patches. And owlets and fledglings, fledglings will typically have just a solid yellow or solid brown chest. During breeding season, they can be active for 24 hours a day, but take shifts. So you may see uh, one colony of burrowing owls just active all the time. They mainly hunt close to the ground by hovering or flying really low even taking uh, short hops or running after prey. They'll eat lizard snakes, frogs, toads, turtles, baby birds, <laughs> um, baby ducks, small rodents, even like moths, beetles, caterpillars, crickets, and even scorpions. Um, when birding and looking for this owl, a spotting scope may be useful since they're pretty small compared to the wide open areas that they live in. And you may also notice just at the tippy tops of their heads poking up out of the ground, they're very observant. So they will absolutely know that you are watching, but as long as we don't disturb them, they probably won't flee their colony or their burrow. Now I'm gonna pull up um, just a few vocalizations for you just to give you an idea of what they sound like. I think the call is so cute. And it's very different than a great horned owl. Okay. All right, next, this is one of my favorite owls. I think they're so unique. Um, this owl is a medium sized owl, about the same size as a crow. Very pale, lanky birds with whitish 
heart-shaped facial discs. Um, they are smooth, round-headed owls from the family Titonidae, and they have dark, dark brown eyes. Their wings are very long and rounded, and they have a short tail. Um, if you combine all of those very unique body parts, when, when they're in flight, when they're flying, they have sort of a buoyant, bouncy flight pattern. Um, it's pretty distinctive from other owls. And all of their undersides are light colored. Their backsides are mottled brown, gray, even tan. So I do see one correct answer in the chat, Gabriella. Excellent job. This is a barn owl. And here's some more information about barn owls. So barn owls are nocturnal, but they can leave their roost to start hunting early in the evening. So they're kind of a mix between crepuscular and nocturnal. Uh, like I said before, as far as coloration goes, they're mostly overall pale with dark eyes that we've already mentioned. And they have a mix of buff and gray on the head, back and under wings, or sorry, upper wings, and are white to pale buff on the face, body, and under wings. Um, there are some color variation in barn owls. That doesn't mean it's male or female, um, contrary to popular belief, but um, there may be some advantages to being one color or the other. Um, for example, on moonlit nights, the difference in coloration may have an effect on hunting success. Um, for example, if you are a duskier colored owl, you may be able to sneak up on your prey a little bit quicker. But if you are a paler owl, you may be startling your prey a little bit easier. So we're not really sure um, what the advantage might be, but on well-lit moonlit nights, there does seem to be a little bit of difference in um, hunting success. Misty, these are also my favorite owls. <laughs> I am a little partial. Um, as far as nesting goes um, and diet, barn owls eat mostly small rodents, mainly voles, but also rats, mice, lemmings, shrews, even bats and rabbits, sometimes small birds. Um, they do hunt at dusk and at night by slowly flying over open fields with slow wing beats with that, um, that light buoyant um, bouncy flight pattern that we talked about before. They do have a heart shaped facial disc, which of course funnels sound directly to their ears, but also is shaped like a heart. So a lot of humans will associate um, love and affection toward these owls simply because of their, their face shape. Um, and then nesting, typically barn owls will do a scrape nest, which is not necessarily building anything or adding anything to a nest. They'll probably, or they'll usually find a little patch of dirt or a cavity somewhere like in a barn or a, um, an attic or the upper parts of a church, you know, little little cavities, scrape a little bit in the dust, and that's about it. They typically won't add anything to that. Um, they're known for nesting in nesting boxes, though. So if you are going to bird for these owls, just keep an, keep a lookout for nesting boxes, owls leaving or returning to those nesting boxes, barns, home attics, churches, things like that. Um, and if you are going to put up a nesting box, be sure to research before building and placing that box. Um, there is a cool website that you can go to. It's nestwatch.org. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, if I remember. Nestwatch.org will help you choose the species of bird you want to build a nesting box for what size it should be, what color to paint it, if you want to paint it, and where to place it, how high off the ground it needs to be, things like that. All right, I'm going to 
play some sounds for you. There are a lot of different calls that the barn owl makes, but there's one in particular that we'll hear if we are out birding for them. And I think this one's it. It's sort of like a screech. So very different than what we're used to hearing, but it is a really unique sound that an owl can make. All right, next, um, this owl is small, robin-sized, so about the size of a robin, stocky, plump, grayish to brownish, uh, bright yellow eyes. They are tufted. You can kind of see their tufts here. Um, there's a little bit of tufting going on up here and the tufts here are really difficult to see, but they are there. Um, females are normally larger than males in this species case. Um, both sexes are usually gray to brownish with dark and light variation streaks on their chest. So in some of the other owls we were looking at, we talked about barring. Barring can be this way, longitudinally, um, or latitudinally, I guess. But streaks are often this way, going this way on the chest. So you'll see in this owl in particular, you'll see black streaks against a white or light gray plumage coloration on their chest in particular. Um, they do have white wing bars. And you can see in this lower picture here, you can see those bars, white streaks on their shoulders as well. And they have a darker outlined facial disc. And that's what this arrow is pointing to. These little dark colored um, feather patches right here at the base of their facial disc. So I don't see any guesses for this owl. Um, that's okay. I'm gonna tell you anyway, this is, a Western screech owl. Now we do, not we, but there are Eastern screech owls. We have the Western screech owl here in Nevada. They look extremely similar. There are some differences um, in size and a little bit of coloration, but uh, this is the Western screech owl. They are a tufted owl. They are from the family Strigidae and their wingspan is about two feet but they are pretty short. They're very similar size to the burrowing owl, just under a foot. Um, these owls in particular are very good at camouflaging themselves. They are nocturnal, so they're awake at nighttime. And their plumage coloration is super unique in that those barring um, patterns that we saw on the chest also happen on the backside. So it doesn't really matter which way the owl is facing. It blends into its environment extremely well, especially up against trees. Now you can see the tufts a little bit better here. These are the tufts. They sort of look like horns compared to the last picture. This owl, in, <laughs> this owl is not happy getting its picture taken. But when it's not necessarily alert and blending in, you can see those tufts really come through. And in this middle picture here, I really wanted to mention, um, these are the owlets. These are the baby owls right before they're beginning their fledgling, um, their fledgings. So in these owls in particular, I'm moving in so I can see the coloration, but they won't have those spidery streaks on their plumages, but they do have those bright yellow eyes that give them away. Um, these owls are mainly in forested habitat, so we don't necessarily have them in Southern Nevada as much, unless you go up into higher altitude. They really love those bands of deciduous trees along canyons, but they're pretty adaptable. So they can also be found in parks, um, coastal areas, mountains, like right at the edge of those mountains. Um, they're typically sit and wait predators. So they'll perch quietly hidden in a tree and wait and watch for their prey to scurry across the ground. And when that happens, they'll just leave and pounce. 
Their diets are mice, bats, shrews, uh, kangaroo rats, small birds, even fish and amphibians. And since these owls are smaller, they'll also eat grasshoppers, moths, worms, even scorpions, very similar to the burrowing owl. Um, depending on where they live, they basically eat whatever they can that's small and moving on the ground and easy to get a hold of. These owls are far more often heard rather than seen simply because they blend in so well. Um, and they can sometimes be seen being harassed by groups of songbirds. So they're pretty tolerant of people, but since they blend in so well, they may be nesting in cavities in trees or in cacti, but that's also where songbirds will nest. So songbirds are pretty darn aggressive. They'll, they'll be harassing these owls pretty frequently. So let me turn off my laser pointer and I'll play some sounds. I have, I have had someone describe the call to me as like a high pitched bouncing ball, <laughs> which is pretty descriptive. I have to agree with that. All right, next, this family is, oh, sorry, this, <laughs> this owl is from the family Strigidae. They're not a round headed owl. That is a typo on my part. They are a tufted owl, as you can clearly see. They're pretty tall. They're 16 inches in height, almost two feet tall. They are medium sized, very slender owls with long prominent ear tufts. Um, now remember, we have already talked about the great horned owl, so this is not the great horned owl. They're similar to the great horned owl, but larger than the screech owl, larger than a crow. Um, their heads are pretty square-ish and they're fairly dark birds with buff and orange cinnamony facial discs um, that aren't really outlined, they're just sort of there. And then they have vertical white lines between their bright yellow eyes. And you can see that better in this second picture right here. Those bright yellow eyes stand out, but also they have these white lines between their eyes. They do have very intricate black buff and brown patterning on the feathers, and it isn't really any pattern that can be defined. So we've talked about barring, streaking, um, mottled pattern. This is just sort of blotches. <laughs> it's nothing really def defined or definite. Um, yeah, Gabriella, this is a long-eared owl. Beautiful. That's a really, really good guess. Um, the thing I love most about long-eared owls is that they always look so excited. Um, just because I think the shape of their body and their tufts, their ear tufts are normally just always up, but to me they always look excited. Um, and you can see that right here in this picture really, really well. So long-eared owls are nocturnal and spend most of their days roosting in the densest parts of pine and thick cut trees. Um, they'll normally roost near the trunk of the tree where their plumage provides excellent camouflage. In flight though, um, we can see those large rounded off wings and streaked underparts just a little bit better, but not much. Like I said, that streaking isn't as defined as other owls might have. So on the back sides of their wings, we might see some checker pattern going on, but it is just undefined blotches, very mixed matched patterning of brown, light brown, black, even gray. And then on their, um, on their facial disc, they'll have that orange cinnamony color. 
And also in flight, I forgot to mention this too, also in flight, those tufts, those very long um, slender tufts will be slicked back up against their, their heads. So even in flight, it's very hard to tell which owl is which. Um, as far as nesting goes and hunting and diet and things like that. So birders can look for long-eared owl nests in thick trees with dense vegetation. That's where they like to roost. Um, adjacent to open scrublands and grasslands. Juveniles or fledglings, that's what these, that's what this little one is, um, are sometimes called branchers. These owlets or owl, young owls, will often hang out just outside the nest and are fluffy, super fluffy, with light brown downy feathers with that prominent V right between their eyes. These branches are still learning to be adults on their own. Um, so they're often seen sort of hum, um, hopping, jumping, pulling themselves up through branches with their wings and with their bill. So they often also fall out of the tree and land on the ground. Um, owls don't weigh that much though. So they don't get hurt when they fall, they just sort of bounce. And then you'll see them clamber back up into the tree and hop around the branches while they practice flying. In the winter, long-eared owls can be seen roosting communally with other long-eared owls, crows, black-billed magpies. Um, I have spoken with hunters before that if they see black-billed magpies, they'll often look for branchers or long-eared owls that are young right near there too. So these owls are not really a threat to other songbirds compared to the other owls that we've already talked about. They do hunt on the wing, so in flight, um, above open grasslands and shrublands. They make very low coursing passes back and forth over those open ground areas. So as far as birding goes, if you're going to go outside birding for these owls, that's what you'll look for. You'll look for branchers and you'll also look for that hunting pattern of slowly maneuvering back and forth over open areas. They rarely hunt before true dark, so you won't really see them during dusk. You'll see them a little bit earlier in the evening. Um, they do eat, <coughs> excuse me, they do eat just about anything. Um, it's very similar to a great horned owl, but they do really like small mammals like voles, all different kinds of mice, rats, shrews, pocket gophers, and rabbits. But whatever they can catch as prey, it's often pretty small. Um, anything that they can grasp a hold of and carry away that's about less than two ounces, they'll do it. And now I'm going to pull up some vocalizations for everybody. So very similar to the great horned owl, but it's just one note, just one note. Very distinct one note. All right, next. This is one of my, one of my very favorites. I mean, I am partial to the barn owl, but I also love this owl. Um, this is a round-headed owl, but there's an asterisk there. You can see that my arrow in that middle picture is pointing to those little tiny tufts that you normally won't ever see. It's when the owl is very alert that you get to see them. Um, this owl is medium-sized or crow-sized with round heads apart from those very, very short ear tufts. Um, the ears, as mentioned in their name, this is a short-eared owl. I did see Gabriella got that one right. Um, might be very difficult to see, especially in flight. And you'll see that down here at the bottom. Very similar to the long-eared owl, those tufts just get slicked back against their head when in flight. They really only show themselves, or the owls really only show themselves um, 
when they're hunting, they do stay pretty well hidden though. So short-eared owls have a very unique coloration. Um, they do, when in flight, you can see that they are lighter colored on their belly and on their underwings, but they do have what we call a bracelet or the beginning of a bracelet or wristband right here. It's sort of like a comma shape um, that is very distinctive between these owls compared to other owls. Their faces are pale with bright yellow eyes accented with black smudged outlines, sort of like they have smudged eyeliner on. Their breast is heavily streaked with brown and their chest and belly are pale or buff colored. So you can see that streaking happening right here in this picture. Um, compared to some of the other owls we've looked at, like uh, that the barring or the spidery streaks, this is very clearly streaked up and down specks. Um, their pale underwings, right? We talked about their pale underwings do have that dark comma shape. And uh, their facial disc is light gray to gray, but it's outlined very defined in white. Um, Short-eared owls live in large open areas with low vegetation like grasslands, meadows, savannas, marshes, and dunes even some agricultural areas. In winters, they've been spotted in um, grave pits like rock quarries, which is pretty neat. They do nest on the ground, as you can see in this picture here. And that's um, earlier when I mentioned that they do stay pretty well hidden, that's why. They do nest on the ground underneath shrubs, in low grasses. They're one of the only owls that construct their own nests too. So they'll build their own nests. They do hunt on the wing, uh, so in flight, during low light hours of the day, flying over short vegetation and open areas. They, when they're in flight and hunting, they flap with very stiff wing beats and they do a lot of gliding. So they will have sort of a buoyant um, bouncy flight pattern, but it's a lot smoother and they do a lot of gliding. So you'll see just a couple wing beats and then some gliding happening. Um, they are extremely maneuverable in the air. So while they're hunting, they can just suddenly drop and capture prey if they need to. Birders can find this owl perching in low trees or on the ground near nests, but you really have to look because they're so well camouflaged. And during breeding season, they're active all day and all night. They'll take shifts um, with their partner, but they do still prefer those low light times. They eat uh, mostly small mammals, especially mice and voles, but also rabbits, pocket gophers, bats, weasels. Um, also birds such as shorebirds, songbirds, even gulls. Um, their populations tend to fluctuate directly with the population of mammals around. So if they can't find the mammals they're looking for to feed their families or their chicks, their owlets, they'll typically explore other areas. Oh, I need to turn off my laser pointer. All right, so I'm going to play some um, sounds for everybody. They sort of, to me, sound like a cat. A little bit. Sort of a unique, a unique call happening here. All right. And this is the last owl that I will talk about and then we'll test your knowledge. So this owl is very small, very, um, very charismatic. Um, they have very large rounded heads and no ear tufts. So this is a round headed owl from the family Strigidae. I do see some correct answers coming through. This is a Sawit owl, the Northern Sawit owl. This owl in particular is used in artwork, furniture, lamps in particular, paintings, 
this species of owl is the very, um, the very well known owl in the art world. They are very nocturnal and very hard to see. Um, during daylight hours, they roost in super dense vegetation, typically just above eye level and near the trunk of tree, so deep in the tree. This is that owl that I mentioned in the beginning that as their main defense mechanism, if they're spotted, they will hold absolutely still and squint their eyes just a little bit, very similar to the, the picture that you see on the left there. Um, in an effort to stay camouflaged and very still in their unmoving surroundings. Even though this might seem like they might be tame or okay with us getting closer, that is not the case. If we do see a sawwit owl or any owl for that matter, the goal is to not disturb them and respect their space. It's just something to note when birding for these owls. They're very well known for their color pattern. So they're strictly brown and white. They'll sometimes have some tan and gray, but not normally. They have bright yellow eyes, checker patterning on the inside of their wings and um, streaks of brown and white on their chest. Their facial disc isn't necessarily well-defined, but they will have a V shape or a Y shape between their eyes. Their nestlings or their owlets are super cute. They have, um, let me turn on my laser pointer. They have cinnamony or orangish chests. They do have that white Y, that white V, all brown heads, and they do make excellent eye contact. So when they are spotted, the owlets will do the exact same thing as the adults. They'll hold extremely still. Um, they are known to nest in nesting boxes if the right habitat in that area has what they need. Um, they are sit and wait predators, patiently perching very low in trees, waiting for their prey to come by. They love small mammals like mice, shrews, voles, chipmunks, maybe some squirrels, but they'll also eat grasshoppers, beetles, and moths. Um, very rarely they'll eat small birds. Predators of this owl um, are wide ranged. Great horned owls will eat them. Western screech owls will eat them, even though they're roughly the same size. And other raptors like Cooper's hawks or peregrine falcons will eat them too. So I'm going to play some calls. So a very high pitched continuous beep is what's happening with this call. All right, uh, that was the seven most common species of owls that we have here in this state of Nevada. So uh, we do have a little bit of time. We're going to test your knowledge before we wrap up this evening. I really do appreciate too everybody participating in the chat, guessing the owls for the most part, everyone did an amazing job. So I'm going to show you a picture of the owl I expect everyone to get it right. Uh, we shared a lot of information today. So here is the list of owls that we went over. They are in no particular order. But in the chat, go ahead and please type in what owl you think this is. If you don't know, it's totally okay. But yes, this is a long-eared owl. Great job. You can see the, the very slender shape, boxy head, bright yellow eyes, and very um, long and slender ear tufts. Go ahead and type in the chat what you think this owl might be. I do see some guesses coming in. However, I have not seen the correct answer.
This is not a screech owl, but that is a very good guess. They have a very similar uh, body shape. Yes, this is a northern sawwet owl. You can see the brown and white um, streaking happening and their very large head, bright yellow eyes. Good job. And go ahead and type in the chat what you think this owl might be. Yes, this is a Western screech owl. The plumage patterns that give this owl away are the spidery streaks, the blended streaks that show up all over its body, the not well-defined facial disc and the horn-like um, tufts. I'll give you just another moment to guess this one. If you're unsure, it's completely okay. This is a short eared owl. You can't really see any tufts happening even though it's in flight. What gives this owl away as far as, um, we can see sort of some behavior happening so with a short-eared owl, they typically will have very stiff flight over um, open grasslands, and that's what we see here. We also see a very well-defined facial disc outlined in white, bright yellow eyes outlined by smoky eyeliner. That's what it sort of looks like. And pale underwings with that comma-shaped wristband happening. That is a short-eared owl. Yeah, this one's, this one's good. This one was easy. This is a barn owl. What gives it away is the heart-shaped facial disc. You can kind of see that right here. It has a little bit of a widow's peak happening. A very pale underparts, dusky or buff tan colored backsides of its head and checkerboard patterning on its um, backside of its wings here. Good job. Good job. I see a lot of great answers in the chat, excellent. Yes, this is a great horned owl. Um, if you remember from the beginning, this, this is the very first um, owl that we spent a little bit of time on. And I hope everyone learned that new word of vermiculation. That's what this patterning is called. Really thin squiggly lines that go straight across. That is called vermiculation. Uh, they do have that white patch on its chest and some bright yellow eyes, well-defined facial disc, um, and um, really long ear tufts. So excellent job, very impressed. This is the last one, last one. Yeah, I do see a lot of answers coming in. This is the burrowing owl. A couple things that give it away. One, it's on the ground. Two, they're, um, they have very charismatic faces, always looking a little grumpy. And three, there's more than one. So burrowing owls do live in colonies and that should be a giveaway as well. This to me is one of the easier owls to go birding for. They're pretty adapt to living near human development, loose soils on the edges of neighborhoods and um, residential areas, but um, and once you sort of know where a burrowing owl burrow might be, you can always go visit. All right, excellent job. So um, thank you everyone for participating. I would like to share with you some very cool resources before we say goodbye for tonight's program. 
first, the very first one is iNaturalist. That's online and the app. We mentioned it in the beginning of the program. Um, that is the, the summer nature blitz that's happening from May this summer to September 15th. Super easy to join through iNaturalist.org. And um, I really highly recommend joining the project, getting out, exploring, and anything that you capture or observe or upload will automatically be shared with all the biologists and professionals who are collecting data. So you're not only learning something for yourself and getting out, you're also helping our wide variety of biologists who are studying these populations. And it doesn't have to be owls either. It can be any wildlife, any plants, tracks, anything you see. Um, here are some other, here are some other resources that I personally love. eBird online and there's an app. Audubon, Merlin Bird ID online and an app. That's one of my favorite ones. The Raptor ID app is all raptors, allaboutbirds.org. That is where I found all of the vocalizations that we shared with you this evening. It's allaboutbirds.org. It's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in New York. Any field guide, that's what's being covered right there. But also just get out, get outside, even if you take a picture of plants and upload that to iNaturalist for the Summer Nature Blitz, that is absolutely doing your part, that is absolutely helping. So questions, I didn't see any questions come through the chat. I'm gonna pop into the Q&A box very quickly. It looks like there were no questions this evening. That's wonderful, thank you so much. Um, lastly, I would like to say thank you to all of you for participating. Thank you to Riley, who's helping moderate tonight's program. Thank you so much. Um, a couple things before we say goodbye. There will be a survey that pops up right at the very end. It takes about a minute and a half to complete. Do we just want to improve all of our programs and help, um, help them be more fun and help them be more knowledge-based and activity-based. So please go on, share your thoughts. I will never see it. So um, we really appreciate your honesty in these and it only takes a couple moments to complete. We also have lots of programs like this popping up. You can um, view all of these recordings online on our YouTube channel. It's the Endow YouTube channel and check out other programs coming up like this on our Facebook page. We have so many of so many of my coworkers and volunteers and friends are sharing webinars like this and programs and events like this. They're all so passionate and so knowledgeable. They're a lot of fun to attend. So please come to any of them. Thank you so much for coming. There we go. Oh, wrong way. And then lastly, thank you for attending this Nevada Department of Wildlife Conservation Education Program. My name is Jess Brooks. Um, if you do go outside, please embrace the outdoors safely and responsibly. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you so much, everyone.